Uh, hello, participants, everybody. I'm Dr. Shran, Chief Medical Officer here at Riverside Community Care, and I just wanted to thank you all for being part of this. As you know, this is a recovery celebration. This is our fifth year of doing this to acknowledge just the remarkable journey of so many folks uh, who are here today, and sadly, the journeys that ceased for those who are not. Uh, this theme today is progress over perfection. It is so important to recognize that sobriety this is a marathon, not a sprint. But every moment of every day is moving you further in your journey. We're so glad that you guys are excited to be here. Uh, I, I want to make a request. You'll notice that there is a chat. Uh, I am inviting anyone and everyone to please put in the chat the names of those that you may have lost or the names of those who you're concerned about or the names of those who have that meaning to you uh, in their own journey as they journey with progress over perfection. So please, please put those names in the chat so that we can remember and recognize them. I'm delighted also to say this, that, that this is a virtual thing because I don't know if you know, there was this big accident on Route 3, this Vicks Vaporub truck crashed, uh, but luckily there was no congestion for three hours. So with that in mind, I would like to and have the great honor and privilege of introducing uh, our uh, Vice President of Behavioral Health Services, Kim Fisher, who is going to take us in to the next part of this journey. Folks, I will see you in a little bit. Kim, handing it over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kimberly Fisher. I'm the Vice President of the Behavioral Health Services Division here at Riverside Community Care. And many of you know, especially if you've been to this event in the past, um, I lost a partner in 2007 to substance use and since have really committed my career to helping people with substance use and co-occurring disorders. Um, I, I was actually fortunate enough to start Connect to Recovery in 2020, right before the pandemic. And it was the first program at Riverside really focused on helping people with substance use disorders. We have grown immensely in our ability to do that here, including offering medication-assisted treatment at multiple sites, substance use disorder specialty clinicians and prescribers. And we've expanded our lived experience work first almost fourfold um, from what it was before 2020. We're here to celebrate recovery and progress, not perfection. But I want to say Connect to Recovery is kind of more of perfection. I was talking to somebody yesterday about um, how over the years, numerous people have talked about the Connect to Recovery staff and how happy they are. They might be happy, but it really is gratitude. They emanate gratitude for their recovery and other elements of their life, and it shows every day in the work that they do. I'm a very visual person, and I almost think of this as like a pyramid scheme. But if every recovery coach is helping 20 people on their caseload at a point in time, the impact of, of the message of gratitude and recovery is so exponential. If even one person on that caseload at that point in time is able to turn around and emanate that same gratitude for recovery to others, we've helped thousands and thousands of people over the past four and a half years. And this is what we need in order to reduce the rise of fatal overdoses. I want to introduce Alan Meister, a colleague of almost a decade of mine um, and program director of Connect to Recovery. Alan. Thanks, Kim. Um, I don't know how to follow that up, uh, your uh, nice words about our program. Um, I am a, a friend and ally of recovery and have uh, personally practiced recovery principles in my life for uh, more than 30 years. Um, as Kim said, I am the program director for Connect to Recovery here at Riverside Community Care. Um, we are a, a community-based program that supports individuals by connecting them to community resources, providing support and encouragement in their recovery journeys. Um, we offer uh, a number of services, recovery support navigator, recovery coach, uh, the community support program, and we also offer our BHJI and CSPJI programs that provide specialized services for justice-involved individuals. Our desire uh, to provide quality peer services to persons served has been demonstrated by our commitment to train all of our staff as recovery coaches and to assist them in becoming Massachusetts certified addiction recovery coaches. 
It's really a privilege to be part of this fifth annual recovery celebration uh, hosted by Connect to Recovery. This year's theme is progress over perfection. So we chose this theme because it represents the reality of recovery. You know, it'd be nice if we could do recovery perfectly. One could just declare themselves in recovery and then walk off into the sunset, never looking back. But unfortunately, that is not even close to reality. The truth is recovery is hard and it rarely takes a straight path. It's more like a hiking a mountain trail. As you ascend to the, to the summit of the mountain, sometimes you find the path is actually descending. This can be incredibly discouraging if you do not realize that the way to the top of the mountain is to turn around, is not to turn around and give up, but to continue on the journey, regardless of the twists and turns one might find. If you stay on the trail, you will make it towards the summit. In life and in recovery, things do not always work out the way we had them planned. The Connect to Recovery staff understand this and see it as part of our mission to come alongside individuals and encourage them to continue on their recovery path. At times, progress can be measured in leaps and bounds, and at other times, it can only be measured in small increments. But even with the imperfections of the journey, progress can and will be made. So now I invite you to watch a video montage of some of the people that we've had the opportunity to help as they talk about their recovery journeys and how they have been able to make progress over perfection. Riverside has been a beacon of hope and support in my journey towards recovery and mental well-being. Their approach to treatment, which integrates mental health and substance abuse services, has provided me with the tools and resources necessary for healing. And the personalized care and unwavering support from the amazing people at Riverside have empowered me to make significant strides in my recovery. Also, the dedication and compassion of the staff have been instrumental in creating a safe and nurturing environment where I could confront my challenges. What does progress and perfection mean to me? I personally know that I should not strive for perfection. Why is that? It is because I have learned through Lisa's guidance that perfection is not what counts. It is progress. Without progress, you cannot earn perfection. If I have continued on my path before working with Lisa, every time I had a reoccurrence, I would likely not be here today. Lisa has gently reminded me that the journey to healing and peace is about progress and not perfection, allowing me to find grace in my own imperfection. With her unwavering support and understanding, she has taught me to cherish each small step forward even when the path feels uncertain. Lisa's belief in me has helped me to learn to be kind to myself, embracing my growth one day at a time. Hi, time. my name is Todd, and uh, I am recovery, and um, I just, I'm here to tell you how good uh, Connect Recovery has been to me in my life, and you know, I've been out about almost 10 months, and you know, been with it was a Sajani pipe, and some things in my life wouldn't have gone as smooth as, and as well as they have. Um, I'm involved with some other Riverside services and it's just been really good to, to come out and to be a part of the, the community and be involved with AA and a recovery coach and just to have people in my life that care and, and actually love me. Hello, my name is Tyrell Williams and I'm here to advocate for Connecticut Recovery. Um, it's been a great resource for me since being released from incarceration. One of the things that they really hope you give back to is to affirmate yourself back into society. I personally think that everybody should get involved once they get released from incarceration to try to get their feet back into society and become a better person. Me personally, it's helping greatly to the point where I think that I'm ready to move along in my life and better myself from what I've been in the past. I've progressed pretty far over the course of three years. I was also using in one of the years, so it kind of didn't do much for me at that, at that time because I wasn't utilizing them the right way. But it, uh, once I finally got like recovery and started working my program, um, I started getting better and now I'm about to go to school in the fall. He said, I'm not looking for perfection, just some progress. In it. In the beginning, I didn't know what that meant. Some progress forwards. I soon started looking at the progress we had made rather than the perfection. And it allowed me to see what is working rather than what I've been failing to accomplish. The team at Riverside has always been wonderful. They've always been there when I needed 
Tell me to depend on. Well, I want to thank all of those who have been contributing to that. Those are powerful stories. And, you know, in order to share one's story, one has to trust. And we know that respect is what leads to value and value leads to trust. And I do hope that every single person here recognizes the power of that that at any and every moment you can remind someone of their value. Whenever you do that, you increase your own value. And that is part of this recovery process. That is part of that progress over perfection. We keep moving forward. Sometimes we go back. This is not a direct path, but you each can do it. I wanna remind people, please put in the chat the names of those people that you may have lost uh, to this to this devastating component. And yet here we are, we are here. And I get the great honor now of introducing uh, Christina. Christina, uh, real quick, grew up in Somerville. She's seven years in recovery from heroin addiction. She has told me that she's grateful to be alive and pass support on to others. Was a participant in Connect to Recovery uses her lived experience now to help others, which is one of my phrases, contribute to society to help with your sobriety. Contribute to society to help with your sobriety. When you contribute, you increase your value by increasing others. Isn't that what we really want and what we need to do? Christina also just received her master's degree in clinical mental health counseling, excited to support our community. Please, Christina, take it away from here. Hi everyone, hope you can hear me. Um, I'm over here getting all emotional. Thank you so much for doing this and just supporting the community. Um, it's an honor to be here and to be alive and have a chance to give back to others. Um, the person I'm here to introduce is uh, someone I got to work with personally and what an honor to get to know this person, um, to see people transform so much in such a short amount of time and I always tell them I've seen them give back to the community and speak and, and help others. And I'm like, you remind me of Chris Heron. And they're always like, I don't know who that is. Uh, but just a, a genuine example of what a good male in recovery should be. He's a family guy. I've seen it, it, it could have went either way for any of us. So to see someone be successful, happy and holding it down for their tribe, it's an honor to know you and an honor to have worked with you. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Mr. Jonathan Keller. Hello. Thank you very much. Um, I'm honored to be here. Christina, you need a raise. Um, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm actually at work right now, but uh, I'm 47 years old. Um, I have a problem with uh, alcoholism, and uh, my favorite drug of choice is cocaine. And uh, that was my best friend, and that started out as when I was in high school, I was a senior in high school, and that's when the first time I did a bag of Coke. And I thought it was the best feeling, the best thing I've ever done. I even put it in my yearbook. That's how much I loved it. But uh, through the trials and tribulations of doing drugs and drinking, it didn't get me anywhere. It always got me uh, in jail and into fights. And, uh, you know, it was just a, it was a miserable life to live. Um, so let me fast forward a little bit. What brought me here is... Uh, I'm married. I have a beautiful daughter, a beautiful house, some two dogs, and uh, by the grace of God, I'm still here to enjoy them and enjoy everything about it. Um, I've been sober for now for about uh, two and a half years, and uh, it's the best thing I could have ever done. Um, and to help people, which I never thought about helping anybody before because I could give two shits about anybody but myself. And what got me here... What got me here is um, Memorial Day weekend two and a half years ago. Uh, I was working and I came home and uh, we were going to a party, my wife and I and my daughter. And I got something. I got a, a bag of cocaine. And beknownst to me, it had fentanyl in it. And I had no idea what fentanyl was. And I, I would honestly, I never thought anything like this could ever happen to me because I know better. I know what the difference would be in what I'm doing, but I didn't. 
And like I said, we were going to a party and I left to go get beers and then come back home to meet my wife and my daughter to go. So I got, I couldn't wait anymore for the person I usually get things from. And I had someone else go get me because all I want to do is get high. And I couldn't wait. I had the anticipation. I couldn't wait. It was awful. So I did what I did and it had fentanyl in it. So I left my house and uh, I was driving down the street in my truck. And that's the last thing I remember. I woke up, um, I woke up in an ambulance and they said, Johnny, uh, you just overdosed. Um, we had to knock in you seven times. So but it's to I thought it was a dream in the when I was in the ambulance and uh I started coming through. They had uh they found me actually in a parking lot. Get it I got out of my truck, I ended up pulling over miraculously. I'm not sure how because I don't remember any of it. And uh I woke up in the ambulance and um they said, Johnny, you overdosed, not can you seven times and I started coming through and I thought it was a dream and I said, Oh no. I was like, what must be happening to me must be happening to my wife at home. And uh, it sure did. Um, she ended up overdosing at home with my uh, my 10-year-old daughter. Thank God my daughter was there. Um, I got brought to the hospital. The police were, uh, they met us there. They met me there. And uh, I said, listen, I was like, I'm at rock bottom. I'm crying. Uh, I, I don't know what to do. Um, I told the police officers, please go back to my house, go upstairs in my uh, in my bathroom and grab that bag up there I have, which they did, thankfully. And um, I sat in the hospital, hooked up to all these IVs and fluids, and uh, I was just sitting there crying because I couldn't believe. And I had no idea what happened to Erin. Um, I was looking for my wife. I was wondering. I was asking questions. I had no idea what her story was. And I was scared. I was, I've was i never been this scared in my life. And I was scared. And uh, I seen these two ladies at the door of um, my hospital room. And I knew who that was. I knew that was DCF. And I knew they, I knew they were coming for my daughter. And uh, what, I, what I had to do is get my bearings and get out of there. And that's what I did. And they said, that's not on my... Uh, not the best choice to do, but I ripped out all my IVs and I Ubered to my family's house where my daughter was. And um, I got out of there and I Ubered and I see uh, I see in tow is DCF behind me with their headlights. And I'm calling my parents where my daughter is and I'm calling my cousin saying, get my daughter out of there. Because I knew I had to get sober with my daughter in a brick and mortar building or foster care. I wouldn't be able to do that on my own. So uh, they took my daughter out of there. Uh, my cousins did, and uh, I knew what was next also is that I'd be going to court. And uh, I finally, I, my daughter got out of there. I made it home after a couple hours, and finally my wife came home after a few hours of uh, not knowing where she was. She came home, and we just sat and hugged each other, and we cried. Uh, we dumped all the booze out we had, and we, we were pretty emotional and didn't know where to turn. Um had no idea what to do so we dumped out all the alcohol we went to court i think it was that tuesday and then uh and then we go to court and we see uh dcf there we see uh we see lawyers we see the judge and uh it wasn't the best feeling at us for all because our daughter was taken our daughter had to go luckily to live with my family um which she did and i remember her saying daddy why am i being punished for something you did and I couldn't answer that, and I just cried. Um, still chokes me up till this day. Um, it's pretty emotional um, what we were going through. The uh, judge uh, said, "Guys, you got to get your shit together." And we didn't. Uh, we'll see you in a couple of months. DCF uh, gave us all these uh, chores we had to do, and uh, we didn't know where to turn. We turned to Riverside. My wife turned to someone that she knew in AA. She started going to AA, and I sat at home, and I basically sulked because I couldn't believe what was going on, and I didn't know what to do. Um, and they said, you know, you got to start getting with the program here. And they could, uh, DCF even said, you know, you got to do what you have to do to get your daughter back, and I can see you're not doing that. And I wasn't. Um, I was mad at the world. Um, I was sober. I was mad at the world. 
I finally started to Erin, you know, I thought she was the queen of sobriety and I was fighting with her over this as well. And uh, finally I got my ass to go to a meeting and I said, wow, that it's not that bad. Um, so I started going, I started going with my wife more and more and more. I said, this is actually pretty awesome to stay sober. I uh, was a lot different from what I used to be. But as the months go by, the months go by, it got easier and it got easier. And I said, wow, I really like what I'm doing here. I finally, I got a sponsor. Uh, we're best friends now. Um, and then we started going to court, going, getting more privileges with our, with our daughter, um, which was, it was tough to handle because she wasn't at home. She was at my family's house and it took about a month before we could even talk to her or see her, you know, and just thinking what's going through my daughter's head was just, I was beside myself, but the program helped us cope with all these new feelings that we had. And, um, one day at a time we did it and we kept doing it. And finally a year goes by where we did what we were supposed to do. The judges could see what we were doing, our lawyers and what we were doing was actually a miracle. And we were getting sober we started going to detoxes and trying to talk to other people and help people out. And my wife and I as a couple, and it was awesome. And we still do it to this day. We do have our daughter back. The judges commended us on how we worked the program and how we did everything as a couple. We have our daughter back. Um, our daughter's been thriving. Um, she goes to AA meetings with us and, she says, Daddy, she, you know, I see what drugs and alcohol can do to people, and all I want to do is help other people. She went to a meeting last night with my wife, and they love her there. And she wants to, you know, that's what she wants to do in life. She wants to help people because uh, she's seen what, honestly, the drugs and alcohol have done to her parents. Um, we're thriving now. Um, you know, I'm not perfect, um, but my wife and daughter don't have to worry about daddy coming home and being angry or what kind of mood I'm ever going to be in because I'm not, I, you know, I can talk, talk about my feelings now. I'm not holding all the emotions in like I used to when I was drinking and explode and they'd have to worry about what kind of mood I'd be in. Um, now my life is not perfect, but it's not anywhere near where it was. And I'm loving life to these days. We go on vacation. We just went to Disney World. We have a beautiful house. We have, um, like I said, it's not perfection for us, but I am happy where we stand right now. And uh, our daughter thrives. My, and my relationship with my wife is very good. Um, you know, no more police calls, no more assault and batteries. Um, and I didn't notice it. I didn't see it then either. What our problem was, but it was uh, a lot to deal with the drugs and alcohol. Um, I really appreciate you guys having me on here. And uh, I wish the best for everybody. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you, Jonathan. Powerful. Right? Progress over perfection. And Johnny, that is sure a story about progress, but that powerful line why am I being punished for something you did? You know, addiction is not about morality. It's about mortality. It's just the way the brain is. When you use drugs or alcohol, you release a chemical in your brain called dopamine, the neurohormone of pleasure. It's selfish. It's addictive. And dopamine interferes with oxytocin, not oxycontin. Oxytocin, the neurohormone of trust. So, you can get high, but the price you're going to pay is trust and the people who love you. So, Johnny, thank you so much for sharing that story. It's not about morality. It's about mortality. It takes a long time for that brain to recalibrate, but it will. It will. Let me introduce Roger Good. Roger Good, a recovery coach with Connect to Recovery, last three years, recently certified by the state of Massachusetts as a problem gambling specialist. We are going to be building problem gambling work here at Riverside, another addiction that is completely, more often than not, dismissed. So Roger has initiated our problem gambling. He's a therapist, a support group here at Riverside. Roger, take it away. 
Thank you, Dr. Joe, and I'm so delighted to be here and to make this introduction. It's with pleasure and pride that I get to introduce the following speaker. When we first started working together, it was a challenging time for Erin and her family, as Jonathan just mentioned. But Erin is resilient. Erin's a driven person. She found her path to sobriety and the reunion of her family was nothing short of amazing. Please welcome Erin Novi. Hi, <laughs> um, I will just say a little bit about myself. Um, I was born in the South side of Chicago. Um, I come from both of my parents being alcoholics. Um, growing up was very, very difficult. Um, I was bounced around from my mom to my Debbie to my grandparents. Um, I ended up being raised with my grandparents due to self-harm. Um, it was just very hard for me to deal with my emotions when I was a kid, um, hence the drinking. Um, faith to me helped me a lot throughout this. Um, in the beginning, God wasn't a punishing God to me, but religion was forced upon me. Um, my grandparents were devoted Catholics, um, church and praying were demanded of me. And um, now that I see, I see God in a different way. I see him in my daughter. I see him in my husband. And now I thank him for my beautiful family every day. Um, I go to him whenever I feel I need guidance or I need answers in a tough time. Um, what actually got me here was, as you heard my husband, it was Memorial Day weekend and I went to the beach with my daughter and we were drinking. I well, not, I was drinking all day. Um, I went with um, her friend and her friend's mom and it was crazy because she wasn't drinking at all and I was just, I was pounding them back. I remember leaving the beach knowing that my husband was going to make a call for cocaine and my daughter asked me, she's like, mommy, can we go to the park just for a little bit? And I yelled at her and I was like, no, we have to go home. We have to go home. And I was just in this hurry to get home to do drugs. And um, I finally got home. As my husband said, it took a while to get it. And we went to someone we didn't know. When we got it, my husband did his and I did mine. He went to go get beers. And right away, I felt very uneasy. I felt very lightheaded. I never, I didn't feel right. So I called him and I asked him, I'm like, do you feel okay? Cause I don't feel okay. And that's when he said, it's okay. It'll pass. And then I never heard from him again. I then got up and I tried to go to my kitchen. I stumbled and I fell to the floor. At that point, my daughter was screaming. She said, mommy, get up, mommy, get up. I heard her, but I couldn't get up. And finally I heard her on the phone and that's what got me up. She was, she called her grandfather. Her grandfather called 911. They were trying to talk to each other, but finally the EMTs just showed up in my house. It was a whole team of them. I was scared. I knew the minute they came in my house, my daughter was gone. I knew it. So they kept asking me, Aaron, what'd you take? What'd you take? And I wouldn't tell them. And I was like, I think it's food poisoning. My fridge is broke. I, you guys can go. I'm fine. And they're like, no, your blood pressure is too high. You're on the verge of a heart attack. We got to take you in and do some tests. So at that point, I was walking down the stairs. I got into the ambulance. And at that point, I asked, I see my daughter on the side of the road. She's crying. Uh, John's father was right next to her. And I asked if John could go grab Gigi because I was so messed up. I thought John was still home. And that's when the ambulance driver told me, he was like, your, your husband died. He, the same thing is happening to him, to him as, it is, as it was happening to you. At that point, I freaked out. I tried to get out of the restraints. I said, this is not happening. This is not right. Go get him. At that point, the nice police officer that actually came to the scene got called that my husband made it and he was okay. They brought him back to life. And at that time, I went to the hospital and um, that ride was the worst ride of my life because I knew um, I knew I was going to lose her and it was the worst feeling. <laughs> and um, when I got to the hospital, 
um, the nurses were great. Um, you know, John was asking about me. The nurses came to me and said how grateful I should be that my um, that I'm okay, that things could have gone so wrong, and my husband loves me, and he's right down the hall. And at that point, the police officer came in and um, he asked me, he was like, where's the drugs? I was like, I don't know. I'm like, there's somewhere in the house, um, but my husband knows. And he's like, you know, um, I'm not going to uh, charge you with child endangerment. He's like, but I did call DCFS. And at that point, my heart dropped. Um, at that point, I put my hands up and I prayed to God that please let this be okay. Please let this go. Okay. And, um, that's when the two ladies came in and man, they put it to me. They were telling me how selfish I was. If my daughter put one single finger on that fentanyl that she could have died in instantly. And, um, that scared, that scared me. I never realized how selfish I was in drinking and drugging. And I needed to hit rock bottom in order to see that. Um, at that point, I did go home and um, I went into a deep depression. My husband was my rock in those three days because I would not get out of bed. I didn't eat. I couldn't sleep. I just, you know, growing up with an alcoholic mother and that happening to you, it was just... It was the worst feeling because I promised myself I would never be like my mother, but it happened. And um, at that point, you know, when she was with Lauren and John and helped me get out of bed because I knew she was safe. And at that point, I can concentrate on myself. Sometimes you need help in order to concentrate on yourself. Um, so at that point, I jumped into my recovery. I went to Riverside and I did anything I could possibly do. They have so much to offer. Um, I went to a Zoom meeting, the five agreements. I love that meeting. I learned a lot about myself with that book. Um, I have a recovery coach. He called me every week and just, you know, help talking to a fellow alcoholic or someone in recovery really helps. It's I, my family was behind me. My sister who I love Holly was behind me, but you really hear what you need to hear when you talk to a fellow alcoholic. You get the answers you need. Um, so I also have a therapist in Riverside, um, which is crazy because I should have been in therapy years ago with my childhood. But now that I'm in therapy, I've come to realize that I always, I drank to not feel. And you need to feel to get better. And that's what I'm doing right now. Um, I feel a lot of feelings. Um, and it's great. Sometimes it's hard, but in the end, it's great. Um, because it definitely helps me grow. Um, I got a sponsor. Um, I hopped into AA. You know, I went to Riverside just trying to do what I needed to do to get my daughter back. Um, but when I went to my first AA meeting, that's when my eyes opened. I heard all these stories. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's me. Like I did that. I did that. I did that. It was nuts. So when I heard that first AA meeting, I jumped even further into Riverside. Like I put my heart and soul into all my recovery and it helped so much. And I have grown so much since that first day that I overdosed. Um, to me, progress, not perfection. I love the term life gets lifey. When that happens, my character defects may creep out. I may act inappropriate, but the progress in me now is that I know what they are and I talk about them with another alcoholic or my therapist and I better understand the situation at hand and make amends if needed. This is one of my favorite sayings, progress over perf no, progress, not perfection, because no one is perfect in recovery. We make mistakes, we have disagreements, but we're all just trying to get better each day and every day. Sober is progress. Thank you. Wow. I don't know about you guys, but I am full of goosebumps hearing these stories. 
Aaron, thank you. I heard her, but I couldn't get up. I heard her, but I couldn't get up. But you did. And you have progress over perfection. And then you said how selfish I was in drinking and drugging. But that's what we're trying to say. Addiction is not about morality. It's about mortality. With that dopamine is interfering with that oxytocin. It's about trust. And you go to those meetings and you hear other people trusting strangers with their stories because you are not alone. You are not alone. Folks, let me remind you, please put those names of people in the chat, the names of people that you've lost. We want to recognize them. We want to recognize everyone. You are not alone. Powerful. I want to now reintroduce Alan. I don't think people realize what Alan Meister has been doing. He's a program director for Connected Recovery since 2020. He's worked in the field of substance use 30 years. In addition to his work at Riverside, he's a facilitator and trainer for the Recovery Education Collaboration and also runs the Celebrate Recovery Ministry in his church. Alan, thank you for being here. Take it over. Thank you, Dr. Joe. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce our special music guest and my personal friend. Paul Alves is a person in recovery from substance addiction, food addiction, and mental health issues. Born into an immigrant family and raised in Newark, New Jersey, he discovered freedom in the arts and became a sought after musician in New York City. Paul has curated, performed, and produced events with artists ranging from original 60s groups to some of the biggest pop stars in the world. As his story spans from North America to Europe, it was New York City that led his journey into recovery in 2008. Paul's experience spans the continuum of care. He has guided individuals in prevention as a drinking driver program instructor, in treatment as a substance use counselor in a co-occurring medication assisted treatment program, and in recovery as a peer recovery coach. Paul is a nationally certified peer recovery support specialist through NADAC, a recovery coach professional facilitator with CCAR, and a Massachusetts state certified recovery coach. Currently, uh, Paul is the founder and executive director of Choice Recovery Coaching, a nonprofit organization dedicated to championing and developing the peer recovery workforce. With a positive attitude and contemporary perspective, Paul believes that all individuals have the ability to recover. Please sit back and enjoy the music and testimony of my friend, Paul Alves. Good afternoon, everyone. Very happy and grateful, very grateful to be here today. Uh, so, ooh, progress, not perfection. Uh, I think my entire recovery has kind of been a uh, I really love that motto from the moment I stepped into a, a, a church basement in the Lower East Side of Manhattan uh, in 2008. Somebody with a whiskey in their hand um, uh, offered me a drink, right? And and I said, ooh, not, not, yeah, I, I think I'm about to, I, I don't want to, I don't want to drink anymore. And then he said, oh, wow, that's, that's cool. Right, and there's this place, you know, on up on 11th Street, and that was my first foray uh, into uh, the world of recovery. Um, and just in a nutshell, after years of hiding um, everything that that happened to me since I was, uh, I'm an only child, right? So uh, since I was little, um, up until I was 36. Um, I had started uh, drinking when I was nine because um, there's wine barrels in the basement, right? So it was easy. Um, so, you know, fast forward. Um, yeah, I spent 36 years um, kind of hiding, um, hiding uh, what I was doing and what was happening to me uh, until the one day where I had an intervention. And that intervention was um, I came home at... Uh, I, I thought I was coming home early because my parents were visiting me um, from uh, from 
their country in Portugal. They're visiting me in New York City and staying in my little little one bedroom uh, New York City apartment when I came in at five in the morning and um, I snuck into the bathroom to take a shower. And you know, once I made it to the bathroom, like I thought, like okay, I'm safe. I can take a shower now and and all will be well. But once that was uh, uh, once I went into my room. My dad was sitting there on my bed, and um, that was the day I was busted. I was busted. That was the day, uh, you know. Regardless of everything else that um, that had happened, the arrests, and um, you know, trying to break sidewalks with my face, and all kind of fun stuff, um, I was busted. So um, I, I want to focus, you know, the next couple of minutes just from there moving forward, um, because after I went into that church basement um, a week later. And um, I, I realized that, whoa, you know, what is this? And there was really a lot more to it than just the, the stopping uh, drinking. I stopped drinking, I stopped using cocaine, I continued smoking, I continued uh, cannabis use, uh, I continued wheeling and dealing, I continued womanizing and all kind of uh, ill stuff um, for a long time. I found that I had a mental health challenge. Uh, I ended up with severe health challenges um, when I stopped smoking uh, cigarettes uh, two years later. And um, I had this, you know, my whole life changed like once again. So um, hence, you know, the food challenges and um, it's been quite, quite the journey. And Three years in, I figured I, I have to stop, you know, working in nightlife. I made some changes. Um, I tried to go to school um, for a, a bunch of failed a, attempts at, you know, going to school for business, going to school for for uh, real estate, um, and all these different things that I tried um, in in terms of getting well and getting better, right? And and you know, making a living uh, was a whole. Uh, very large, large issue because uh, I, I worked in nightlife and in the arts, um, and that was kind of a difficult path. I had burned a lot of bridges. So uh, until um, my counselor, uh, three years into recovery, said, "Hey, you know, there's this employment program," and then uh, uh, so I went to uh, at at the time I was in New York City, so Access VR, which is kind of like mass rehab. You know, and I went through this whole program and they said, you'd be a great counselor. <laughs> so that's kind of how I, I got into, into the field. Um, so uh, Alan mentioned the arts, big part of my life. Uh, guitar has been my friend for many, many, many years. Um, I had a lot of success, um, not as much as some, a lot more than others. And uh, at the same time, um, you know, in recovery, this progress, not perfection, right? I started having uh, healthier relationships. Um, and so I got married in recovery. I had a child in recovery. I got divorced in recovery. I started multiple businesses in recovery. And um, finally, the one thing that has stuck has been, um, has been this world of recovery and recovery coaching and supporting others and supporting others in in uh, uh, doing better for ourselves, right? For themselves, for ourselves, for our communities and for, for the people around us. Um, so with all, all that, um, you know, there's, there's gonna continue, you know, being ups and downs in the world of, of recovery. Uh, I'm 16 years in now uh, and, and it's still, uh, there's a whole bunch of new problems, which I kind of, I, I always welcome new problems. I, I don't want old problems, Right, because that means I haven't done the work, uh, and there, there's still stuff that I that I'm contending with, you know. Which there's always something new, you know, as we go through the stages of recovery. But I want new problems because new problems are going to force me to work on new skills and new learnings and meet new people, right? Um, so, um, and with that, um, I was going to play live, but we weren't able to get the sound uh, going here. Um, I've brought music back into my life once again. I'm focusing again on on playing my guitar and writing songs and and uh, getting out there, you know, as as an artist in my fifties and in recovery. 
Um, so it's very exciting. I put a little video together for you all of, of me down in, in my, my little basement studio of uh, playing a tune. It's called Star Child. And it kind of, uh, it, I wrote it in pre-covery, um, you know, about somebody who uh, at the time, uh, you know, had a lot of challenges, you know, was in the community. And it also really kind of speaks to me in recovery today as um, I always feel like a stranger in this town and, and I'd love some help. So, um, Alan, if you can roll, roll the video, that would be wonderful. And thank you.
Pretty dang good, Paul. Wow. Really enjoyed that so much. But I, I, think I also really enjoyed just sort of watching your face as you were watching you. It was great. Started drinking at the age of nine. Nine years old. Folks, this is a powerful part of our brain. If you start using any drug or alcohol after the age of 21, one out of 25 people at risk for lifelong addiction. But if you start using before the age of 18, that's what Paul's telling us, that maybe what Aaron and Johnny, you start using before the age of 18, that number goes from one in 25 to one in four. One in four, just because the way the brain's developing. A kid can start using drugs or alcohol without thinking about the future. It's about morality? No. It's about mortality. It's just the way the brain is. And the other part Paul was saying was hiding what he was doing. You know, I work with a lot of kids. Uh, and I work with a lot of parents who worry about their kids and are so angry with their kids for using. Why do they keep it secret? They keep it secret because they still care what you think about them. Think about that. We all care what everybody thinks about us. And we have spent so much time in our world stigmatizing those folks struggling with addiction. Come on. That's what Connect to Recovery is about. We're going to change that paradigm. Change that paradigm. Please, everyone, put those names of the people that you've lost in that chat, because we're going to be doing something very important. I want to now introduce Dan Foley, who will be taking us into our moment of silence. Dan is a person who's very open vocal about his own substance use, his own mental health recovery, and is the assistant program director for Connect to Recovery here at Riverside Community Care. And he also wanted me to be sure people knew that he's a loving father of two very energetic young boys and a caring husband to an amazing wife. And he is also really good at dad jokes. Dan, take it away. Uh, thank you, Dr. Joe. Um, it's The irony isn't lost on me that I'm taking care of the moment of silence because silence isn't a word that most people associate with me. But um, I got to also just a huge thank you to John, Aaron, and Paul for sharing with us today. I'm so grateful for everyone that took the time to join us today as we celebrate these individuals and feel the hope and inspiration that they just exude through sharing about their recovery. However, we're all here for a reason. And that reason is likely because substance use has had an impact on us in some way, shape or form. It may be a personal firsthand impact. Could be seeing someone we care about going through it. Um, but one commonality that I think is very likely that we all share is loss. This disease has taken so, so many amazing people from us. It's difficult to even comprehend at times. For me, those losses started a long time ago. They include family, friends, colleagues, people that I supported in their recovery journey, people that supported me in my recovery journey. That list just goes on and on. But all of these losses, they've all had a profound impact on me. And I have made the conscious, very conscious decision to not let the loss of such unique and amazing people happen in vain. I try to live my life every day knowing that they're still with me and recognize the fact that they are also living vicariously through me. I keep their memory alive honoring all of the phenomenal things about them and the impact they made on me as well as their respective communities. So with that being said, I'll now ask that we all bow our heads for a moment of silence to honor and recognize all of the amazing people that are no longer on this planet, but that I do believe remain us, remain with us as we live our lives. Thank you.
That is the silence. So many experience. Voices we will never hear again. But their memories live on in you. Their loss, I hope, inspires you to help others never go down that path. But it is a silence. Yet we must not be silent. We must come together and shout out that we can do something. It's about progress, not perfection. We will do this. Contribute to society to help with your sobriety. Thank you, Johnny, Aaron, Paul, sharing your stories. Thank you, Dan, Christine, everybody for doing this. Before we go, I want people to really think about getting Narcan. Please carry that Narcan around. Give it to people. Give it to your kids to carry around just in case. You never know. But we can do this together. You're not alone. You're not alone. Connect to recovery. We are here for you. All you need to do is come and find us. We're here. Everybody, thank you so much for being part of this celebration. Now let's go. Let's get to work. Thanks, everyone.